And next to me is uh, the smiling drummer, who is our guest today, Mr. Lewis Nash. Hello, Lewis. Hey, everyone. Good to see you, Brett. Lewis uh, is perhaps one of the most recorded drummers in jazz. He's played on literally hundreds of recordings with many of the great artists. Uh, but since the pandemic, uh, he's returned to his native Phoenix and uh, is teaching at ASU. Are you enjoying the, uh, the teaching experience, Lewis? I certainly am. Thank you. Uh, great to be here with you. And uh, yeah, for me, um, at this stage of my life and career, it's very fulfilling for me, actually, to be able to be here and share some of the, uh, you know, many varied experiences I've had over the years with some of the students. So uh, I'm enjoying it very much. Well, your students are very lucky to have such an experienced, uh, well-spoken teacher, for sure. Uh, you know, Lewis and I were talking about this yesterday, about how in the old days, uh, musicians would get their chops together and if they were lucky, would join the Jazz Messengers or Cannonball Adderley or maybe Miles and learn from their elders. And uh, the elders would pass on the knowledge and the young people, the young musicians would learn and move on. Now, Lewis, you, what, what, after, you didn't really start as a jazz drummer, but your first major gig you went to the University of Betty Carter. Could you tell I us about that? Did. Tell us about Betty. Yeah. Well, um, the way that came about was uh, I was a student at Arizona State University at the time in the in the uh, late seventies, uh, early eighties. So uh, I believe it was probably nineteen eighty that Billy Taylor came to Phoenix with his trio. And so playing drums in that trio was a gentleman by the name of Freddie Waits, Frederick Waits. And so Freddie Waits, uh, I, I went to listen to the performance and I had an opportunity to introduce myself to Freddie Waits. And I was of course very um, moved and, and uh, taken by the, his, the way he could control the drums, the drum set in that situation and his, uh, creativity, his solos and the things that he was doing in the context of the group. So I inquired about studying. And uh, up to that point, I hadn't really had a, I hadn't had a drum set teacher. So this would be my first kind of uh, formal, uh, regular drum set study. So um, he agreed. And I went to, so this was the summer of 1979, actually, to be exact. So in 1979, I left Phoenix that summer and went to New York City to uh, study with Freddie Waits. And um, after that, uh, I came back, of course, to, to go back to school. And um, in 1981, uh, Betty Carter was looking for a, a drummer. And of course, she Freddie had a relationship with her. He's one of many great drummers who went through Betty Carter's band in, in some capacity and for a certain length of time. Freddie, D Jack DeJeanette, uh, Billy Hart. I think that there's so many great drummers who at some point played with Betty, Kenny Washington. Uh, so I um, was recommended to Betty by Freddie Waits. And so based upon Freddie's recommendation, I uh, went to New York in 1981 knowing that the possibility there was a possibility that I'm if if the audition <laughs> was successful uh, then I would I would possibly be in Betty Carter's trio so I had that in mind I prepared myself listened to as many of her recordings as I could um, particularly the most recent ones and so that I would be aware of her most recent repertoire etc got the vibe for how she liked to um, you know, pace her sets and all that stuff. So I prepared as much as I possibly could without being there. And when I went, uh, you know, she, she met me at the airport, actually at JFK. We went directly to her house with my drums and suitcase from the airport. And uh, she was set up to rehearse. The bassist and pianist were there. And, and as soon as we got to the house and I got set up, we jumped into the rehearsal. And after a, 
a bit of time and her having a chance to hear me, how I fit in with the guys and play some of her repertoire, which I knew because I prepared myself. Um, she said, okay, kid. She called me kid all the time, probably the whole time I was with her. I was 22. Okay, kid, you got the gig. Uh, do you have a passport? No, of course. Uh, well, you better get one. Uh, our, we're going to Europe in the uh, summer and um, our first gig is next weekend at Blues Alley in Washington, D.C. And that started my career with Betty Carter. <laughs> and who was in the band at that time, Lewis? Uh, the bassist was Curtis Lundy. And the pianist at that time was a, a gentleman by the name of Khalid Moss from Dayton, Ohio. Um, prior to him was Mulgrew Miller. Uh, and uh, of course, I had many opportunities to work with Mulgrew, and he was a dear friend of mine after that. But um, uh, there were a couple of different pianists and bassists during my tenure with Betty. But the, uh, the people who were there when I got there was Khalid Moss and Curtis Lundy. Well, certainly Betty had a way of getting the best pianists. I mean, she had John Hicks for a long oh, time yeah. and yeah. Uh, Benny Green also yeah. uh, played with Betty. And uh, yeah, Benny came in uh, the last year I was with Betty. Benny was in the band. Yeah, Betty was unbelievable. And uh, Betty didn't. Uh, I, I, let me just come out and say this. She didn't, Betty wasn't someone who put up with any bullshit. Betty Carter was about the truth, plain and simple. She yes. spoke the truth and she lived it. And uh, you know, that may have alienated some people, but I, I think that's I think that's a better way to go through life, to speak the truth. And she certainly did. Yeah. If I could say, address one thing related to that, I would say that it was probably, if not the best, one of the best situations for me to become initiated to the whole New York and uh, road thing. Because like you said, she was about the truth. You had to be professional. You had to know what, you know, uh, be on top of your game on stage and off. She was no nonsense. She didn't mince words. She'd get in your face, you know. So uh, that's that aspect. And then from the musical standpoint, a wide range of uh, skills you had to have together for her. She played some of the fastest tempos I ever played in my life and some of the slowest tempos I ever played in my life. So Shirley Horn, Ray Charles, slow, <laughs> and Max Roach, Sonny Rollins, fast, <laughs> you know, or uh, that's one way of looking at it, you know. Well, you mentioned slow and fast. I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't hear people playing ballads like they used to. I used to hear a lot more ballads, uh, and some people say, well, you know, it's harder to play slow than it is to play fast. <laughs> what, are you, what are your feelings on that? Well, I, I think there are, you know, e each of those things playing uh, extremely slow ballads and extremely fast tempos require um, a certain skill set, of course, and they require patience in order to be able to do them, you know, in a fluent uh, non-stressful, you know, kind of way. And um, I advise uh, uh, to address what you're saying about not a lot of people doing either of those things these days. I always um, uh, try to encourage my st students now to do it, even though it may not be something they might do on every gig or on any, any gigs or, or very rarely. But I, I believe it's a skill set that should be you know, addressed and 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 uh, made sure that you're at least familiar with, and and do it regularly, so that if you suddenly get called upon to do either of those things, you're at least uh, well versed in in how to navigate. You know, either either extreme, I guess, would, would be the way of saying. Now, Lewis, you mentioned at the top of this that uh, oh, all of a sudden, what I was going to say popped out of my head. Oh, I'm sorry. Freddie Waits. I knew Freddie. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, a fantastic drummer. Yeah, Once did an interview with him and he said, you know, I really don't like my instrument being described as the drums. I said, well, how do you describe it? He said, the multiple instrumental kit. So yeah, he, he called it, it, it was the, the MPI, multiple percussion instrument. 
Multiple percussion instruments, thank you. Yeah, I want to yeah. look at a video here of one of the pioneers of the uh, multiple percussion instrument, yeah. and we'll talk about it some. Okay. was from an old uh, jazz at the Philharmonic and uh, amazing Papa Joe, you know, never yeah. ceases to blow. I, I was to watch that clip of 50 times and it never ceases to blow my mind. Yeah, I've, I've seen that clip countless times and others of the great uh, Joe Jones, who to me is it's at the very forefront of modern drumming still now. You can, in that solo alone, you can see all the techniques that we all all use still now you know, in modern drumming, even if it's uh, a contemporary jazz group. S several of the things he was doing are just a part of the jazz drumming vocabulary, uh, you know, an integral part of it. So um, one of the greatest to ever sit behind a set of drums, pick up sticks, pick up brushes, just uh, you know, everything's there. You know, one of the comments was that he always had a smile on his face. I mean, there was a certain uh, grace to Joe Jones when he played. I mean, he was a performer, you know, yeah. but it, it wasn't it wasn't sensationalized or anything. He just he had his own way of playing the drums and, and it came through. And uh, certainly uh, we had another comment here that uh, Joe Jones, Walter Page, Freddie Green, Count Basie, the greatest rhythm section in the history of mankind. <laughs> Well, you know, the whole when you think about Joe Jones and the and the the beginning of his career, you know, drummers were playing a certain way. And at when his career ended or when he was older and by the time he left us, drummers were playing a different way, but he was a part of the whole thing, you know, the the timekeeping on the hi-hat for dancers, etc. and and the swinging big band era style and he was also uh, one of the great proponents of when the time moved from mainly being on the on the hi hat to the ride symbol, it was a it, it wasn't for it was as if he was already doing it when he, <laughs> he went to the ride symbol. It was the the same whooshy you know forward momentum you know infectious swing happened on the on the hi on the uh, ride symbol that he had on the hi hat, With, light as a feather when it needed to be. Uh, you can hear the soloing techniques that he used are still used. His his ideas, his uh, the way he phrased all of that is can still be considered modern. And uh, so I, I continually watch and listen to Joe Jones. Yes, absolutely. I think it's yeah. important that we do that. And, and certainly, yeah. Max always paid uh, his respect to Joe. Always mentioning yeah. him and. Uh, I got a chance to, we talked about this, I got a chance to, to hear Joe at uh, the West End, a club in Upper Manhattan, mm -hmm. at a time when some of those elders were, were still with us before they passed. Big Nick Nicholas, the tenor player mm -hmm. who Coltrane wrote that tune, Big Nick for, and mm -hmm. Doc Cheatham, and mm -hmm. you know, a gentleman from that generation. We're starting to get some comments here. Let me just pull a couple of these in here. Dave Roberts okay. says, Hey, Lewis, you and I both used to work with Keith Greco back in Phoenix. Oh, says, wow. Tell yeah. Lewis I played with Mike Dunham Jazz Quartet there and played with Keith when he wasn't available to play. How says, you doing, Dave? So yeah, this, Keith Greco was a, he was a great pianist here in Phoenix, and I worked with his trio regularly, and I, I learned quite a bit about trio playing from being with his trio. And uh, here's yeah. a chap named... Derek Jones, who says, I met you in AZ at the Nash. Now, oh, okay. Hey, for, Derek. <laughs> for our viewers who don't know what the Nash is, uh, what is the Nash, Lewis? Okay. Um, the Nash uh, is a, a, a center, actually. It's a, it's a venue, a performance venue, and education center combined. So uh, we uh, 
are able to, you know, have instruction for young students who are wanting to learn learn about the music. And we also have uh, master classes and things like that there. But we also pre present, um, you know, high level uh, music. Well, before the pandemic, we were doing it on a regular basis. But uh, for example, um, it opened in 2012. It's it's uh, the, the club is named in my honor, and I'm very grateful for that um, as a native son of Phoenix. And um, the over the years since it opened in 2012, we've had people some some of whom are no longer with us uh, have appeared there. Um, right off the top of my head, I think of Jimmy Heath. Uh, the great Jimmy Heath, Cedar Walton. Uh, as a matter of fact, before the November of 2019, before the pandemic hit, we had Jimmy Cobb, we had Benny Golson, Ron Carter. So I, I made it a point that, you know, these great musicians who were instrumental in my development and uh, growth and development in New York and who, you know, showed me what it was all about, on the road and in the studio and, and just playing this music. I wanted to make sure that I, if I could get them here, that I could uh, bring them out and, and be able to tell the audience what these giants of the music meant and mean to me and have them perform here. And, I was, and Randy Weston is another one. As a matter of fact, I'm glad I thought of him because he just had a birthday, April 6th. Right. And uh, he was here uh, at the Nash. So a great, um, opportunity for me to engage with the community here and um, and just feel the honor of being of a, of a place to be associated with a place like that that uh, helps young people and then uh, presents the, the the masters of the music uh, yeah. at the same time. Well, I think it's important to note that because obviously the names you mentioned are the masters of this music, but what the uh, what the Nash does is serve as a showcase for local musicians who really don't have that kind of opportunity. There's not, That's let's face right. it, there's, there are no full-time, well, the Nash is a full-time place when the pandemic's over, but there are no right. full-time, there are no full-time jazz clubs in uh, right. Tucson or uh, uh, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. uh, although certainly a city the size of Phoenix, one think one would think could support uh, a jazz club, but and anyway, we're very happy that uh, we've got the Nash in Arizona. And another question yeah. here from a couple of questions from David K. He wants to know if you remember a tune called Jabbo's Revenge. And also, is there ever going to be a drum battle with KW at Smoke? I don't, I'm not <laughs> sure who K is. Is that Kenny Washington? Okay, that's, yeah, that's Kenny Washington. Okay, Jabbo's Revenge. Absolutely, I remember. That's a Curtis Lundy uh, tune, the bassist with Betty Carter. We used to play that with Betty. Uh, we would the, the trio would open for Betty's concerts. And so that was one of, that was Curtis's tune. And often we would play that in the trio segment. And uh, you never, as far as the drum, uh, a drum battle, uh, maybe, I don't know. I, uh, I'll i get back to New York. Uh, Kenny and I are, are good friends. And as a matter of fact, I just spoke to him last night. So um, uh, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> well, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Kenny, Kenny's a, a wonderful drummer, but for a number of years has also been on the radio as well. Mm -hmm. And he's mm -hmm. really a historian who can speak at length about the drums and jazz in general. And, uh, you know, this idea of battles, I mean, it's interesting, but, you know, I, I did a video a few years ago uh, with a group called the Saxophone Summit, which at that time was uh, Michael Brecker, Joe Lovano and Dave Liebman. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a tradition of jazz of the tenor battle. You know, there was mm -hmm. Dexter Gordon and Gene Ammons and Johnny Griffin and Eddie Lockjaw Davis, and, you know. And I said to uh, I said to to Michael Brecker, I said uh, this is this was in '99, uh, I guess about seven or eight years before he passed. I said, "Is it like a battle between the two between the three of you?" He said, "No, man, not at all. This is an opportunity for us to play together and inspire each other." And I think. Mm -hmm. If there was a meeting between Kenny Washington and Louis Nash, I think that's what would happen. I think there would be a lot of that's inspiration. Exactly, you know, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it a battle in the sense that we do it. I like to refer to uh, the way Jimmy Heath used to describe it. Well, um, he, he called it friendly fire, friendly fire. You know, so again, the whole idea is inspiring each other and just helping 
the uh, the other person involved in this uh you know presentation to rise to their highest level that's the way i look at it so battle may not be the right word for it necessarily um because in our in our the sense that we do it it's uh as jimmy heats a friendly fire <laughs> yeah absolutely now i, I want to go to uh another one of our uh masters here jazz masters on the drums i apologize for the quality of the video but uh this is a man that we love, and I want to hear what Lewis's thoughts are. I'm talking about none other than Philly Joe Jones. Philly Joe Jones with Bill Evans. Yes. Now, Philly well, uh, Philly Joe Jones really came to the forefront with the Miles Davis, the original Miles Davis quintet with uh, uh, John Coltrane and Red Garlands and Paul Chambers. What was it about Philly Joe that, like, blew people's minds, do you think? Well, well first, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I'll just say Philly, Philly Joe was, I had a chance to hear him, of course, live. But the first jazz record that I ever bought with my own money 
was uh, uh, Blue Train, which has Philly Joe on it, with Curtis Fuller, Kenny Drew, Paul Chambers, uh, Lee Morgan. Who am I leaving out? Train. Anyway, Philly Joe's on there. And um, so that was my introduction to um, Philly Joe, because before that, I didn't have those, the records you're talking about, the Miles Davis recordings, work yeah. and steam and cook and relax and all those. I didn't have those yet. So when I heard Blue Train, then I said, oh, you know, I need to get, I need to find out more about Philly Joe and get some more recordings. So then after that, I bought um, uh, Milestones and and round mid round about midnight of Miles's recordings. So he's at the very beginning of my kind of introducing myself to okay now I want to play this music in an authentic way, and this is the way the drums are supposed to sound. So let me check this guy out, kind of that that way early on. I'm saying you know, um, and so getting back to your question of why. Um, it felt great, you know, it just felt you, you felt motion, you felt forward momentum, you felt uh, ebb and flow, you felt dynamic contrast, you felt, even if you didn't call it that or know what it was, you, you were hearing orchestrating going on, shaping of everything. You know, these are the kind of things that were going on. That's why, you know, I, I was uh, playing for a cl my class at, I, I teach at Arizona State University and I was playing for one of my classes, um, of mo a master class of Mulgrew Miller, talking about drummers and how they orchestrate. And he was, at that point, he wasn't talking about Philly Joe, he was talking about Art Blakey and Tony Williams, but because he played with both of them. But just Philly Joe is an example of what Mulgrew was talking about, which is even if it's just the melody, before you even get to the solos or or his solo, just the things he would play in shaping the melody would be, you know, just something you'd want to remember and 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 make note of. You know, so that's those are some of the reasons why Philly Joe is so, you know, um, at such a high level in the pantheon of jazz drummers, I'd say. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, we want to welcome some uh, fellow musicians here. Uh, I'm talking about Mr. Joey D. Francesco. He's in the house today. Hey. Joe, All right, Joey. What's going on, man? <laughs> Joey and Lewis have been doing some live sessions, some streaming from the Nash. We're going to play that at, at the end of the show, just the two of them, organ and drums. And also our friend uh, Jimmy Green is here today as All well. All right. Yeah. James Green, little Jimmy Green. <laughs> yeah. My man. All right. Good to see you. Thanks, Jimmy. So following up here, one of our viewers says, Philly Joe revolutionized the ra the language of the rhythm section. Do you think that's true, Lewis? Uh, he, he contributed to revolutionizing the language. I mean, I wouldn't say he did it alone because, you know, the rhythm section consists of more than just the drums. So, of course what Paul and, and, and Red Garland and others who played with Philly did is a part of that. You know, they had, they had to do certain things on their instruments to, to go with the things that he was doing that, that were new or revolutionary, so to speak. So I guess you could say that in a certain sense. Yeah. No, I, I want to go to a track here, the final track by another drummer. By the way, we'll be playing something from Joey and Lewis to close out the show. But... I'm thinking about, I'm processing this thing of what makes a good drum solo. So I want to play something mm. by a master and we'll talk about that. Okay.
Yeah, Roy Haynes just turned 96. Unbelievable. So, Lewis, your That's thoughts right. your thoughts on Roy Haynes and second question, how do you construct a drum solo? Okay, so I'll start with with the great grandmaster Roy Haynes as as uh, you and others in the chat have said, 96 years old and still still with us and creative and and uh just a a guiding light for creative drummers and musicians all musicians i i would say um the the thing about roy is um he doesn't come across or at least this is my view he doesn't in his playing and his soloing he doesn't come across as a um like a, a, a rudimental uh, oriented drummer he's he already comes across with a certain kind of openness and freedom even in the way he comps and plays that's not to say that he i mean of course he he uh played rudiments and can do that but i'm just saying his style um has an openness and freedom to it that i always heard that attracted me to it the crispness the um excite there's a certain excitement a certain kind of edge to it i would say um Sometimes, you know, as, as everyone knows, talking about music is so difficult finding the words, but I try to find the things that will give you maybe a closest uh, uh, touch with how, how, I'm here, how I hear him. Um, he's someone who uh, is, is daring, you know. So um, for me, I, when I think about Roy Haynes, I, it, the word freedom just comes to mind, you know. Of course, his time was great. The same as with Philly Joe, it feels great. Every, all of them, the, the guys we're mentioning and who, and who you may show after this, have their own unique um, approach in timekeeping. If I hear the ride symbol of, of either of them, I can tell who it is. You know, if, I, if you play just the ride symbol of Kenny Clark, Max, Roy, Elvin, you know, Joe Jones, all, all these guys, generally you can, there's, there's a certain way each of them approaches their timekeeping and the sound and the, the way that it projects off the symbol. So um, I, I can tell about, of course, you can get other clues from the stuff going on with the other three limbs. But I'm just saying that's a unique thing. If, if you hear Art Blakey or, or, or Max or Roy, you can, you can get an identity clue from just the ride symbol. So all of those guys have that. But just talking about Roy, just taste, that's another word that comes to mind. And that's a word that Freddie Waits used to use with me all the time in our lessons. You know, Nash, you got to play with taste. Got to have taste. <laughs> so um, that's what makes me think of what I think about when I think of Roy, just masterful uh, creativity and freedom, you know. Now, talking about drum solos, you know, there's this could be a whole, we could do a whole hour on just talking about the, the varied approaches. Now, as you know, as we noticed with the Joe Jones solo you showed, with the Philly Joe Jones solo and with the Roy solo, all of the bands kind of um, stepped aside. Some, in one case, they had left the stage, but basically the spotlight's on the drummer to, to have the freedom to create. And so an open drum solo, maybe we might call that, which is where you're not trading or playing over the repetitive form of a tune, is an, is an opportunity to demonstrate your storytelling ability, I would say. You know, how you group the various sounds available on the drum set into a cogent story, a journey. You take the audience on a journey, the possibilities available at the drum set. So you have to use um, uh, dynamic contrast, uh, all the various uh, sounds available on the drum set, you know, give a sense of uh, motion, a sense of, of uh, um think uh wondering what's coming next because of what you're doing you 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 create a a suspense i guess you could say and so the ability to tell a story on the drum set is is key in creating a, a an effective drum solo i would say because uh, a drum solo could also just be a cacophony of uh noise and and uh you know you might in some solos you might as well just throw a whole bunch of sticks up in the air and let them fall on the drum uh, you know what i mean so phrasing and all that kind of stuff is important so absolutely 
Uh, well, we're getting to the end of the show here. A, a viewer posted an interesting comment that I think uh, has a lot of validity. This is from D David. He says, Lewis, thank you for your continued contributions to music. You never stop inspiring us. I've learned a great deal from watching you live as listening to your records. Oh, thank you so much. Very, very kindly. I appreciate that very much. Well, those of us who've been lucky enough to hear Lewis live and also follow him on recordings know that there's a reason that he appears on so many recordings. Uh, because people love to play with him and we love to listen to him. So we're going to close out here uh, with uh, Joey DeFrancesco and uh, Lewis uh, from their uh, NASH uh, streaming sessions, which have, were posted last month, the month of, month of March. Uh, they had one, uh, one concert a weekend. Hopefully there'll be more. Uh, before we go, any closing words, Lewis? Well, um, I'll just say uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, you know, about these great drummers and, and thank you for sharing the, the videos of, uh, of me. Um, that initial opening video you played of the Brushes solo, that was uh, from um, the Mid-Atlantic Jazz Festival um, with Mulgrew Miller and Terrell Stafford and others that we were playing the tune uh, uh, without a song. And it, it, that was not an open drum solo, just to be clear. I was playing on the form, but you don't have context to hear it in. So just in case any of you drummers were wondering, that was not an open drum solo. I was actually playing on the form of without a song. Okay, well, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. And, uh, but here, here is, is, is uh, Habra 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 Habra. Let's listen to uh, Lewis and Joey recorded last month at... Uh, uh, the Nash, uh, the standard in the soul of the night. And please come back next week. We're going to be featuring the Jazz Heroes. Uh, the Jazz Journalists Association once a year uh, produces a list of people around the country who are doing something for jazz. I was very happy to be included in this list. And we're going to have a little talk with all 23 Jazz Heroes next week. So, Lewis, thanks a million. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And Dig, Lewis, and Joey. What do you feel like, Lewis? Maybe something with a little tempo to it. Yeah. Something upstairs? It's still on the night? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Where do you like to do it? We can do it like up here. Mm -hmm. Right on it. Okay. One.
Thank you.